Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Kostas Arpanas. I work at the European Commission at the Open Science Unit. Uh, this is a panel session uh, follow up from the uh, morning session. We're discussing the European COVID-19 data platform and uh, its connection to EOSC. We have um, the three speakers as panelists, um, Guy Cochrane, Marion Kopmans and Vero Nissen from this morning. And we have two additional uh, panelists. We have Priyanka Pillai, uh, academic specialist at the University of Melbourne in Australia, and also involved in RDA at the RDA COVID-19 uh, working group. And we also have Sylvia Kritzinger. Uh, Sylvia is a professor of methods in the social sciences at the Department of Government at the University of Vienna. And she will talk to us briefly about the Austrian Corona Panel Project which is a panel survey on the corona crisis. So before we get into the discussion and address some of the previous and uh, new questions that you will have, let me ask uh, Priyanka first to, to give a short overview of, of her work and what happened in the RDA with the uh, working group on COVID-19. Thank you, Costas. Um, I'll share my screen now. Give me one moment. Can everyone see my slides? Yes, that's fine. Um, is this the presenter view, Costas, if I may ask you? Or is it, um, can you see the slides or the presenter view? I think it's the full, the full presentation yeah, cool. view, yeah. Thank you, I've got multiple uh, monitors, so sometimes I get confused, thank you. Um, so I would first like to thank the European Open Science Cloud for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this um, panel discussion. I'm very excited to be here and I'm presenting virtually from Melbourne, Australia. Um, and before I start my presentation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to um, the elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend my respects to any indigenous people who may be virtually present with us here today. Um, I'll be presenting a very quick overview of the work undertaken by the Research Data Alliance COVID-19 Working Group. And this working group worked really hard for a few months um, to produce a comprehensive body of work that leveraged a global data community. Um, and my involvement with this group is in the capacity of a co-chair as well as a member of the, the editorial group. And I should, I should mention that all the wonderful work that has been presented today, I think a lot of the recommendations and guidelines that are presented in this body of work underpins um, open science and open data in general. So I think a lot of things that we discuss at an overarching level would apply to a lot of data platforms that are currently supporting COVID-19 um, response. Um, so the Research Data Alliance was launched as a community-driven initiative in 2008, um, 2013 by the European Commission, the United States government's National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Standards and Technology, and the Australian government's Department of Innovation. And the vision was to enable researchers and innovators to openly share data across technologies, disciplines, and countries to address the grand challenges of the society. And the mission was to build um, social and technical bridges that would enable open sharing of data. And RDA has about 45 flagship outputs, which includes eight ICT technical specifications, um, 100 plus adoption cases across a range of disciplines, organization, and countries, more than 100 um, working groups on global data interoperability, working on global interoperability, um, data interoperability, sorry, data interoperability challenges. That is a very tough word. Um, so there are 46 working groups and 60 um, interest groups. Over 10,000 individual members from 145 countries across academia, research, public administration, enterprise, and industry. Um, over 52 organizational members and 11 affiliate members. So back in March, when the pandemic was um, taking off in a lot of countries, there was a call to action by the European Commission to establish a working group, fast track and establish a working group, aimed at developing a system for data sharing in public health emergencies, specifically COVID-19. The aim was to produce a detailed and comprehensive set of recommendations and guidelines. The detailed guidelines were aimed to help researchers, um, data stewards, 
follow best practices to maximize the efficiency of their work. And that would also act as a blueprint uh, for future emergencies. And also to make recommendations to help policymakers and funders to maximize timely quality data sharing and appropriate responses in such health emergencies. And this working group is a, is a result of a massive community effort. This was a community led and community driven um, effort. So over 600 RDM members, as well as newcomers registered for different groups. And when I say group, the working group itself was divided into um, multiple research areas and themes that I will get into um, in the next slide. There were about 160 active contributors to the documents, experts from different fields acted as group moderators. There were regular calls, writing sprints um, and multiple iterations. Um, weekly webinars um, and requests for comments. There were five releases produced between April and May. And as you can see, we started in March and then we produced five releases between April and May. And the final document was released in June. So RDA's principles of openness, consensus, balance, harmonization, community-driven efforts, nonprofit and technology neutral or agnostic, these were the underpinning principles behind this work. So when I said there was over 600 um, experts and people who registered, uh, they were then split into these research areas. So it made sense to have specific research areas that would cover the recommendations and guidelines specific to those research areas. So there was clinical omics and epidemiology predominantly from the medical um, and health perspective. And as we all know, this is not just a health issue. There's a lot of social sciences aspect involved in it. Um, so there was a particular focus on social sciences as well. And then we um, also addressed four cross-cutting areas and those cross-cutting cross areas were applicable to each of those four um, key research areas. So community participation was an important one because community as us members of the community were the primary stakeholders of the information that's being used for response. Um, indigenous data, since indigenous communities experience a higher burden of infectious diseases. Uh, legal and ethical considerations, which are um, enablers as well as also act as barriers for sharing data um, and research software sharing for data analyses during COVID-19. And the experts who contributed was split across these areas as well as cross-cutting themes. We had experts who were um, working across multiple areas and themes. Um, and this just gave a, a, a really good structure for the recommendations and guidelines. Um, so without getting into the details of each of the research area, because then I would be talking for a long time, um, I would quickly summarize what the overarching challenges were. So these challenges were common to the research areas as well as the cross-cutting themes. Um, so rapid sharing of research efforts, findings and data has always been a challenge. Um, and I have been, uh, not for a long time working in public health, but I have been working in public health before the start of this pandemic. And some of these challenges were, um, actively considered, discussed, and there were concerns quite for quite some time. And some of these were also learnings from past pandemics. So rapid sharing of research efforts has always been a challenge. Balancing timeliness and precision, um, lack of pre-approved data sharing agreements, as well as protocols on how much information to share, what to collect, and how to share that. Um, no universal standard and system for COVID-19 research outputs. Um, the cross-disciplinary reusability, as we've seen, it's not just a medical problem. There are other disciplines that actively contribute information um, to decision-making during a pandemic. Contextualization, licensing, and documentation, um, and ad hoc research, research software um, that sometimes it's uh, quite bespoke to a problem which cannot be reused in the future. And some of the overarching recommendations that we made is to have coordinated cross-jurisdictional efforts to foster global open science and cross-jurisdictional as well as cross-sectoral efforts enables a more, um, a more harmonized way of responding to a pandemic. Investment into infrastructure, economies of scale and doing that in the preparedness phase and not once we get to the stage of a pandemic. Um, valuing fair and timely outputs, um, early and frequent update, uh, updating of uh, data management plans in within institutions or even jurisdictions, um, understanding how important metadata is for cross-disciplinary access and harmonization of that metadata, uh, documentation of methodologies, uh, using trusted data repositories, expedited publications and data publications, and a lot of people present here 
would know the um, heated debates as well as the value of preprint journals. We've all talked about it. We know what the value is. We also know how it can be a peril. Um, ethical and legal considerations, not seeing them as barriers, but creating um, those ethical and legal frameworks that would actually um, enable the sharing and reuse of data and speeding up the response uh, mechanism. So that's all from me. That's my Twitter handle. I'm based here at the University of Melbourne. Always happy to have a chat about infectious diseases and data. Um, and I have also linked the COVID-19 guidelines and recommendations. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Priyanka. That's very interesting. And it connects to some of the questions that uh, we're gonna discuss later. Uh, so now if I can ask uh, Sylvia to share her screen and give yeah. us a quick overview. overview. Thanks, Sylvia. Thank you. I now try to somehow share my screen here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hope you can see now my slots. Yes, that's um, fine. Perfect. Yeah, uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to this panel. Um, I'm going to present very shortly what we did in Austria with regards to the Austrian Corona Panel Project. And um, um, this is a very social science perspective. So it's kind of different uh, to what has been mentioned before, but already Priyanka said that also the social sciences were included in their project. So there is also a social science perspective to it, namely that uh, COVID is not only in a health and economic crisis, but also a social crisis as it impacts various societal aspects. And this is exactly what uh, this um, Austrian Corona panel is going to uh, look at. The data collection uh, in the social science Sciences is broad. I mean, the subdisciplines in the social sciences include political science, sociology, psychology, communication science, economics, and so on and so forth. And all these disciplines uh, started uh, a lot of data collection efforts immediately after uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis started, actually. Um, the problem, however, with lots of those data collections, and this is probably very different uh, to the data collections we were talking previously this morning, is that we started data collections uh, after the crisis um, has started, also because we are to a certain extent missing data infrastructure in the sense of data collection infrastructures so that we do not really have baseline measures on a lot of various on a lot of societal aspects before the crisis uh, and um, uh, so this is different in the social sciences that uh, infrastructures in terms of institutionalization and long-term financing is not yet that much in place but at least we made a huge effort to somehow circumvent this problem now in the COVID-19 crisis so what is the Austrian Corona Panel Project about? Well, of course, it's uh, really embedded in the social sciences, tackling upon a lot of disciplines, not only sociology, but also political science, psychology, economics, uh, and so forth. And uh, it is an online panel survey, uh, which we started uh, end of March. Uh, and we ask on a weekly basis in March, April, and June, 1,500 respondents each week. These are the same respondents so we can really tackle uh, changes um, over time very nicely. And uh, from June onwards, we have then moved into uh, monthly waves um, and we're conducting these monthly waves until, uh, we're conducting these monthly waves until September, 2021. But as I said before, we do not have a baseline measure um, uh, so that we do not know how the same people actually changed their behavior over time. Uh, or especially because of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and uh, so therefore this is a, a weakness of the uh, Corona Panel Project. What are the topics? As I said, covering a lot of uh, disciplines. Here is just uh, a short um, example of what we cover. Consumer behavior, psychological predispositions, trust in democracy, perceptions of the crisis and so on. And we can uh, uh, trace that over time. 
what is our data policy? I think this is the most important aspect of the Austrian Corona Panel project. First of all, uh, we were providing access to the data uh, immediately after we received the raw data. We just did a little bit of cleaning uh, to make sure that the data is anonymized or uh, yeah, anonymized uh, so that the researchers in the area could uh, immediately start analyzing the data. Uh, of course, there had to be a proper scientific purpose uh, to be stated, uh, sent to us so that we could actually grant access uh, to the data. But then we uh, put a lot of effort into making uh, the data publicly available as soon as possible with a public release, both as a scientific use file as well as a public use file uh, in mid-July with the first 10 waves. And we published uh, the data via the Austrian uh, Social uh, Science Data Archive, which is a member of ATSESTA and is therefore uh, publicly available. And we continue uh, publishing uh, the data uh, after every fifth wave, also via AUSTA, so that uh, access to the data is granted to the researchers immediately. Of course, this uh, data is also uh, perfectly available uh, to other researchers outside of the social sciences, as long as there is a scientific use uh, connected to that. And it's also uh, linkable to other data sets in case uh, other researchers from other disciplines are interested in. Uh, there is, of course, the problem of uh, data citation. I mean, uh, Marian was mentioning this morning very nicely how to get credit of the work that is done uh, with regards to data uh, collections, data linking, and so on. Uh, this is also an issue that we face in our disciplines uh, uh, regularly. And we circumvented this uh, issue by publishing a data paper immediately uh, with the data uh, as such. And um, I'm not saying that this is, this is an ideal way of getting credit uh, of the data that is going to be collected, but at least there is some recognition possible by uh, writing this data paper and then asking people to cite this data paper. What did we do in terms of dissemination, communication, and societal impact? Because, of course, as I said before, it's not only a health and economic crisis, but also the social crisis. So how to get somehow uh, in, um, in contact with all the different stakeholders involved? Uh, first of all, we provided a website uh, with all the technical data on the data collection. Of course, you can find also all the metadata in the Austrian Social Science Data Archive, uh, but it's a two-way uh, uh, communication process with the stakeholders interested in that um, uh, data set. And then we did uh, a lot of um, communication with the public at large, namely that we uh, wrote uh, daily blogs. Uh, and you can find all our blogs on the uh, website uh, uh, put here on the um, slides, where we informed about findings uh, on a daily basis. We did that uh, daily uh, in the first two months. And now we actually moved to one block per week, plus as the data um, uh, sets have increased over time, as I said, we're now having 15 waves, we also are able to provide uh, dynamic developments over the, the course of the months, and we provide very easy graphs to read to a public audience just to see how the COVID crisis uh, develops over time. It's both in English and German, and um, we provide the data to researchers, students, and also policy stakeholders just to get uh, a lot of um, uh, things out of the data set. And of course, we also do have scientific publications, even though I have to admit that once you're really into data collections and really into the public dissemination of uh, the main um, research findings, the scientific publications are coming a little bit uh, late. And this is probably not ideal uh, for those scholars investing lots of their time in data collections. Here is just a very uh, uh, over uh, general overview on how this website looks like. Um, as I said, all the different blogs, but also information, technical information on the data, the dynamics, and also some English um, summaries that uh, can be read outside of the German speaking countries. And um, yeah, thank you for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia, for this presentation. And let's get directly to some of the questions uh, because we have one uh, for you in the chat. So did you ask for consent from the panel uh, for releasing the data? 
Um, we, we work uh, with a um, survey company and uh, we worked uh, with the online access panel. So all people who actually are part of this online access panel provided their consent before uh, becoming part of this online access panel. So we did not have to ask for proper consent uh, for this particular survey that was already given when the participants um, agreed to be part of this online access panel. All right, that's clear. Um, and staying with the social science and humanities, uh, one of the ambitions of the European COVID-19 data platform is to, to be able to at least associate or even integrate uh, data from that sector with biomedical health data, clinical data. So what, I mean, I will address this to you, but also the rest can, can have a go. So what um, data from SSH uh, when combined with biomedical and health data can improve our understanding for COVID-19? Well, we have a lot of um, <clears throat> questions on the psychological um, impacts of the COVID-19 data. What we are lacking at the moment, and this is definitely something that we should prepare for next uh, crisis is to link the data with uh, other, um, I call it in the social sciences, aggregated data, medical data, and so on. And for that, of course, we have a lot of legal and ethical uh, issues to uh, circumvent in the first place, in the sense that we need to have personal identifiers from our data with then the data from um, <clears throat> medical data uh, bases and so on. Um, apart from the technical issues, I think we which can be solved very easily uh, with uh, putting personal identifiers uh, to the different people we uh, interview. We have a lot of legal constraints. We have a lot of ethical constraints. And uh, there are so many open uh, questions. And I think all the presenters today have already pointed out that they are the main issue we are facing in that, risk in that regard are the legal issues and the, the ethical issues that we somehow have to solve in the future. Right. Uh, anyone else from the panel that wants to address this? Um, if I could quickly jump in, I think um, in terms of um, epidemiology, I think the social determinants are quite important to understand the burden of the disease itself. So there are a lot of factors like employment, housing situation, the demographics and other things that are associated and they're called the social determinants of health that are directly linked with the epidemiology. So even unconsciously, people are connecting the medical and the um, humanities and social sciences data, even without realizing that this is a merge of two disciplines. But if we could facilitate that, if that becomes a policy, if that becomes something that funders actively consider, that these silos of information, not just unconsciously, but consciously need to talk to each other, I think that just gives us a better understanding of the burden of the diseases across different um, settings, across different social settings. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would like to echo yes. that because it is clearly, if we look now at SARS-CoV, a very important determinant of outcome as well. So, uh, it, so it, if, if anything, it is something you really need to stratify for in any analysis that you do uh, for it to be meaningful. Um, and, and this, you know, it adds to the complexity, but I think it's crucial. So I I think there, yeah. I think I think we can think about this in, in, in sort of two different levels, and, and one level is probably easier to deal with. That's the aggregate level, where um, you take aggregate data from the social sciences, aggregate data from clinical sciences or molecular data, so, or so on, and you and, and you can spot patterns. And I think there may be some things that can be done there. But I think, as Sylvia said, it's the it's when you can link data at the level of a patient, so a patient behavior, a patient housing setting, whatever it might be on the social side. Um, and the, uh, I don't know, the, the, the molecular response they've had to the virus, the, the, the haplotype of the virus, and you can do the stratification that Marion uh, described. That's, that's when it becomes particularly powerful, but, but I think that, that's something that isn't straightforward to achieve immediately, that, that deeper layer. All right. Uh, before we go to, to other questions, uh, there's one in Slido, again, about the Austrian uh, effort. And uh, noticing that this is a national effort, of course, but does it connect to other EU surveys like ESS or, or the SHARE? Um, so from Sylvia, I guess. Um, 
Well, of course, when we do um, plan surveys, and I have to say that the planning of this survey was done over a weekend uh, because the crisis was there uh, and uh, we uh, received money and we had to go immediately into the field because it's important to collect data really on the moment and we couldn't wait for um, uh, several weeks uh, before uh, to collect uh, data. But in general, of course, we uh, consider other surveys like, for example, the European Social survey, but uh, also other uh, surveys in uh, the social sciences uh, to uh, look for questions that we could um, add into our survey and therefore at least at an aggregate level to compare them. I mean, uh, whether percentage points do change uh, over time uh, in certain countries. Um, however, of course, the COVID crisis is not something that uh, we had um, foreseen and therefore didn't ask any particular questions on how to deal with such a out with such a crisis and therefore we had to invent quite some new questions where we cannot compare anything uh, to other surveys. Um, however, there are possibilities uh, to compare uh, with other surveys at the aggregate level uh, so that we see some changes over time. Um, with regards to other um, uh, social science um, surveys across Europe, um, the issue is a little bit uh, what has been mentioned this morning, that data access is not that easily uh, achieved in the sense that uh, data at the moment is still kept back. Data sharing is not uh, that openly done as we probably would wish in order to make comparisons uh, across uh, countries or across different health systems. Systems. And in that respect, I think the social sciences are not any different from what we have heard this morning in the sense that uh, we still lack uh, a certain mindset in uh, sharing data openly with each other in a very short time frame. All right, thanks for that. Um, now, there's another question, actually it's from the morning, but it, it's very um, appropriate because Priyanka mentioned how RDA brought together people from all around the world to, to work on those guidelines. And the question was about cross-border uh, data sharing. Uh, what, what do you see there? Is it is it a problem of governance? Is it a technological issue? Or again, do we have different legal frameworks? So who would like to, to address that perhaps? Marion, yes? I would say the answer is yes at all the levels that you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> but there are examples. I mean, the guy showed that there's, what, what is it? 90,000 raw free data sets that were, that were mobilized. Yeah. Um, so so there, there are examples, but if you go into the nitty gritty detail and that's where complexity comes in. So for instance, within Europe, versus outside of Europe for pathogen data can mean different things. Um, the GDPR, which is within Europe, can mean different things in different countries. So we, so there's, for instance, the mobile use, mobile phone use, data use uh, that is allowed across Europe is not possible in the Netherlands using the same GP, GDPR <laughs> as a reason. So, um, and, and, and that I think is part of the complexity. So it's, it's, there is legal frameworks, but they are also interpreted differently. Mm -hmm. um, so part of an endeavor like this, I think should be to try and understand where that is, where the same legal framework is, well, has, has a different meaning because that, that is an obvious barrier that could be looked at. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, yeah. Priyanka? Um, yeah, completely agree with Marion and the interpretation of the legal framework, not just the um, business as usual legal framework, but also under an emergency, what does the legal framework actually allow you to do and not to do? That's a big challenge and understanding of that is a challenge. Um, one of the challenges, challenges that I've experienced here, um, and again, my vision is a little bit narrow based here in Australia, is the biggest concern is the consistency of information across different information sources. So if there's a jurisdiction that wants to report on numbers and wants to share something with another jurisdiction or at a national level, 
Um, and the national level picture is something else because there's different, um, even time zones within Australia, we have different time zones. So the time when the dashboards are updated, the time when people have access to that data, what happens in terms of public health response? Because every single case actually means something. It actually has an implication of the public health response towards the public health response. So sharing that information um, and there's so sharing that information is critical, but you don't know what will happen if that information is inconsistent with other sources of information and what implication it has with um, towards public health response. So that applies in an international context as well. The numbers can be um, can actually play a role in border closures and opening up the borders. So this sounds quite dramatic, but in every case, like I said, it means something when it's reported in the in the right context. Mm -hmm. And Guy, I, I don't know your opinion uh, because you mentioned also the the international collaborations uh, such as INDCC, DSC. So is, is this a way to to have sort of more uh, official international co collaborations for for data sharing across borders? I think it's. I, I think we're learning lots of things. Um, and and so so for the so what's the, I guess a simple case which is the sharing of viral data. Um, we've actually seen, seen the different groups around the world that, that, that all connect together, resolving to a data standard that, that, um, that, that is, is um, fairly minimal, um, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's still, it's extensible. Um, but, but when you go with that standard to uh, different providers. Um, it's. I think sometimes it's not. There's just so, so. So there are issues about the what is allowed and what's not allowed, and there are different interpretations. But I think also in many cases people haven't actually done the interpretation yet. So so some of the reasons it took time with different countries to mobilise viral data was because they were going through the process of of the the public health scientists talking to the policy people and the legal people, uh, just going through the process to work out what was possible. And actually, in many cases, it turns out it is, it is all possible. And everyone agrees that you can share this minimal information. So it's, it's information that relates to the, to the patient that was sampled, but it's very, very lightweight. It's time and place uh, and a few bits of other information. Um, and in most cases, it turns out that's actually not very, um, it's, it doesn't reveal much about privacy and legal systems support its export into other countries. Um, yet people haven't been through the process to do that. And I think what we're seeing uh, in Europe is that we, we're seeing people going through that process and coming out at the other end. And I think that's also happening globally where, where because we're aligned on more or less the same data standard, um, we, we're asking the same questions of all the different data producers in different places. So I think, I think, I think over time, there'll be a better experience of, of, of what can be done and what can't be done and things can be faster in future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Vero? Yes, yeah, so I, if I look at the, um, the imaging domain, the, the, the studies that we did most effectively across uh, the boundaries also with the US was by, by sharing the tools and keeping the data local. So, so I still think that, uh, that, that one part of the solution will be also the, the federated nature, also because this will scale eventually. It will be always difficult to set, set up central repositories that grow and grow. The moment you, you uh, adhere to standards and you allow access, I think it becomes easier because only the software is going to go to the individual level data and perhaps some of the analysis uh, results will be shared and, and that makes it easier. So perhaps on the short term, some of these distributed solutions um, uh, may uh, provide the fastest way to scale up uh, 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 some of the, the questions we can uh, address. All right, and do you see a role for, for EOSC uh, or those, uh, you know, Costas this morning mentioned the, the, for example, the European health data space or similar data spaces for providing this framework of standards or of legal interoperability. So can those uh, actions play a role in, in enhancing and facilitating data sharing? So, so I can have a go at that. So, so the, the, the EOSC has been um, a really important part of building the platform for us. Um, the, the first thing is that it gives it gives access to the group of people that are building the infrastructures around Europe. Um, 
and uh, a network of people who are connected in different ways in different domains. And so the first thing we could do was, was put together a set of national coordinators um, uh, that can connect from each of the different um, uh, governing body states, can connect the right people to talk to from the policy domain, the funding domain, the health domain, scientific research domain, and so on. So, so it provides that sort of ready built network. So that's been really useful. Uh, and then, of course, it has a set of policies, as you say, but also technical, well, technical standards you also mentioned, uh, ways of working across infrastructures that will become more important. At the moment, we, we're beginning to, to connect. So we can connect to some of the catalogs, for example, that the that different infrastructures provide, but we need to do a deeper, a deeper integration. Um, so I think that that concept of having policies that work across different domains, having this idea that you can connect data, you can have sometimes catalogs that are that are centralized or shared. Sometimes you have full federation, sometimes you have centralized uh, repositories, um, that you have a framework for connecting that is, is, is really important. I think that's where the EOSC um, uh, stands to benefit the uh, the platform in the future a great deal, and I think it's it's also reciprocally because I think I think the platform makes use of these things and gives a good use case to steer it and develop things further. Thank you, thanks, Guy. Um, yes, Marin. I have a question for Priyanka on the you mentioned the um, uh, software use. Um, so you have people that develop software fit for purpose that then can be shared, but uh, how is that uh, acknowledged? Because the, 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 our experience so far is that even software that is massively taken up can be difficult to publish. So if, if that's a, a, you know, a young scientist, it's, it's, it's hard for them to just throw it out there. Uh, how have you uh, dealt with that? Um, that's a good question, Arian. And I think a lot of um, drawing from my, my experience here in Australia, I think a lot of the emphasis should be on the preparedness phase, understanding the uptake of software, developing those software during the preparedness phase, also understanding how people interact with those software, how you publish the outputs, how you make the code available, how people are actually responding to um, even open source software. That would be my recommendation in you know preparing people before a pandemic strikes and not getting to the point of point of pandemic and then developing new software because that is bound to be bespoke because you have developed it for a very specific purpose that's compatible for that very specific type of data that you're collecting. Um, for example, there are some influenza data collection instruments, influenza data um, platforms in Australia that are being leveraged and also around the world that can be leveraged because there are a lot of symptoms that are similar. Um, you can add more uh, data collection components on top of the influenza data collection software and not just collection, but also codes. And there are models that are run on influenza data. You can reuse some of those models. You can reuse some of those software, but it's all about preparedness. I think that would be my recommendation. I think there's a lot that the document covers, but this is the lesson that I, I would that I've learned. And this is what I've seen researchers struggling with not having enough resources during the preparedness phase. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe related to that, uh, in, in your opinion, what are some practical steps, really uh, concrete efforts that scientists or, or, or health professionals can take to improve data integration and data interoperability? Yes, happy for me to answer that question um, in a non-European context, if that's okay, in a more generic context. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's not about Europe, right? I mean, this is a, we're talking mm -hmm. about a pandemic and we are facing yeah, global threats. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's lots of emphasis now on training researchers and medical professionals on sophisticated data collection methods. Also understanding the value of harmonization, what it exactly means. Um, so if I could give an example of ISRIC uh, COVID-19 uh, data collection forms, case report forms. These case report forms are harmonized and can be used in any resources, uh, any resource setting. So whether it's um, quite high resource setting or low resource setting or medium resource setting in terms of countries and jurisdictions. Um, and that data collection form was developed with the, with the idea that this should be able to 
so any people with any level of technical technical competency should be able to use these data collection instruments so it's also about the resources that are developed and also improving the technical competency and also training the researchers during the preparedness phase like i said that when you are faced with a challenge of adapting something quickly that will facilitate the response and will expedite the response the researcher should be able to transition smoothly and um, adapt new technologies so it's about training and as well as making the instruments easy as well for the for the researchers to use yeah i, I echo that i think it's very important that the, the prospective data collection is done well what we've learned it's so much time and effort to retrospectively harmonize everything and what we also that even if we try to harmonize from the start, it's still difficult because then still individual studies make changes and any change you make is difficult to, 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 to the data form requires a manual uh, mapping operation again. So, so thinking about how you agree on certain standards and, 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 and don't change those. And if you have additional data, really make sure that they are complementary and, and, and not affect the, the, the original source of data. Th those things, yeah, they require good data stewardship at individual organizations. So, uh, so we, it, is a, it is something we need to invest in, better prospective data acquisition, that the processes are in place, that data can be reused only once we want to collect them, and then we want to reuse them. We don't want to retrospectively have to harmonize them. Yeah. Yes, thanks, Vera. Uh, Marion? Well, I think um, a lot of attention needs to go to the data provider. You know, you know what makes it worth its while um, to to actually do this? Because right now, wanting to share data for reuse, reanalysis actually adds work to what you're doing. Um, and then the question is, why should you know the junior people that are doing this work? do this so so i really think there's a lot about this what is in it for the data mm -hmm. providers that needs to be become crystal clear and whether that's you know there's a whole uh, battery of things mm -hmm. that you think of but it, it, it should become like uh, hey i'm i'm contributor to this uh, and you can use that in your citations or mm -hmm. Yeah. But there, perhaps perhaps not specific to COVID, but more general. We have had this discussion also with medical doctors in general before COVID. Uh, and, and what we have to realize that perhaps when you treat a patient, you should not be paid only for treating the patient, but you should also be paid for the fact that you ensure that data can be collected on that patient that can be reused for research and innovation. So somehow it should be acknowledged that that is a contribution next to the next to treating the patient that actually ensuring data can be reused is, is something that has a value and, and, and should perhaps in a way be paid for. Hmm. Sylvia, you want it? Yeah. yeah, I would like to add something to that because I can agree to everything that has been said also uh, what is in for the people. So how are they recognized for the work they are doing and especially for early stage researchers, this is a very important question to be answered. Uh, but I think that um, uh, we cannot only alone change uh, the system, but it also we also have to consider how the evaluation criteria of research institutions, universities are when it comes to career prospects. And as long as um, they do not change their evaluation criteria with regards to uh, how to evaluate uh, this in uh, this effort in uh, investing into innovation and uh, collective goods, I think we will not solve the problem alone. Right, thank you very much. Uh, any other reflection on this? Um, as a closing, maybe this is the last point that we'll discuss. I think when I said specifically, is, is it in the European context that I'm responding? I think one of the things that I wanted to highlight is um, just the awareness of data stewardship practices. Um, in my experience, working with RDA and working in a different region where um, I wouldn't directly tie that to the response to the pandemic, but I would just 
talk about data stewardship, understanding harmonization, it's quite different across different regions. And the uptake is also different across different regions, whether it's the administrative side of things, whether it's the public health side of things, whether it's medical, whether it's research. So that awareness, if, if we were all in different regions of the world were to get to a consistent sort of, um, were, were to adopt consist adopt and adapt consistent practices and also reach the reach towards a common understanding of what's important from the data stewardship perspective i think that would just facilitate cross jurisdictional data sharing and cross jurisdictional integration of information and would and we wouldn't struggle so much with inconsistencies right uh, thank you very much priyanka uh, just before we we close really uh, i want to thank you all and if you have any last sort of what what have we learned in those past six seven months and, and what, how can we use this this knowledge to to move forward and improve May I start from a social science perspective? I think um, what we have learned is that um, data, continuous data collection, data infrastructures uh, in the social sciences are important. Uh, they should uh, definitely be developed further and also financed further. And also that uh, data sharing uh, needs to be much faster and much more discussed also in our discipline than it used to be uh, before. Um, I'm not saying that that has not been an issue before, uh, but it was somehow of minor importance to, let's say, the majority of uh, people involved in those fields. And I think uh, the crisis has shown that uh, this is a um a problem that needs to be solved in a common effort and uh, that uh, some solidarity and i use this word uh, really as it's uh, what its uh, meaning actually is that's the solidarity between research researchers is important otherwise we will not uh, really move forward in our scientific uh, findings uh, and outputs thank you Silvia. that's indeed very very critical uh, issue Anyone else? Guy? Uh, Guy? Guy. <laughs> so, so I think one thing we've learned is, that is, is the value of investment, previous investment in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I think where, where we've moved quickly with things has been where there has been that investment and where um, work has been already been done to join people together and to join systems together, technically, process-wise, policy-wise, uh, funding-wise, um, and, and, and that enables us to move quickly. So the things that have been on the platform, the things that have been uh, the quickest, have been those things where there's been the biggest investment. Um, and, and that's both a, a justification, but an important statement about uh, how, we, how we do things in the future, um, which areas need further investment now that next time around will be better able to respond quickly. Yes. Vera? I think I actually exactly said what I wanted to say. I would almost like to say we, we, we've seen we lack a good health data infrastructure, apart from some very good initiatives, more perhaps on the more fundamental or preclinical research parts, but we've seen we lack a health data infrastructure for the reuse of data. And I think COVID has made that very explicit, but the good thing it has also made explicit where we need to advance in terms of, of the, the, the legal and ethical issues, the, 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 the the more technical harmonization issues. So I think it's more clear on the table what needs to be done. So we have learned how we can potentially be better prepared for uh, for even uh, the, the, the next waves of this disease and, and, and further challenges. Maria? Yeah, so for me, it's been the, the merging of fields. Uh, so because so many of the disciplines that never were dealing with emerging infections now are dealing with mm -hmm. SARS-CoV. So you get uh, sort of re renewed discussions. And I think, so to, to me, a key element is uh, re none of us should be trying to fix this, to fit this into our own pre-confined box, because then we will fail. <laughs> <laughs> I think. So I think we all should be trying, okay, so this is how I would do it in my own box. Uh, what does that other domain uh, look like and how do we link these, these types of thinking together? 
Exactly, also very important, yes. Cross-domain collaboration, interoperability, cross-border, we addressed. Priyanka, your, your final thoughts maybe, and then we have to end, I'm afraid. Um, I think just echoing everyone else's comments and thoughts, right? So breaking out of silos, because every domain is only enriched when you link that data with other domains, and it gives more and more um, knowledge about the ongoing pandemic or a health crisis, basically, and we can respond better. And preparedness, I keep going on and on about preparedness. I think this is my, my job that keeps pushing me to do that. But I think preparedness, not just in terms of understanding what we need to do, but also investment in infrastructure skills, people improving people's understanding of data management practices, also training people, like I said, skills, and all those investment and even data partnerships. So enabling people to form those partnerships across different domains, enabling people to get together across jurisdictions, sectors, so they can um, exchange information, understand what the information gain is when they exchange data, because uh, combining data gives you more information and knowledge and how that contributes towards um, the response. I think that's what we need to do in the preparedness phase. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank all of you. I, I think it was a very good discussion and uh, I hope also uh, everyone in the audience uh, appreciates it. Uh, we have 25 minutes break and come back for the following session at uh, 12.30. Thank you all very much.